Well, good morning. Glad to have you here this morning at Norfolk Baptist Church. Good to always hear a great buzz around the church, and that just not just my head, uh, but, uh, you know, hearing people sing or talk and all that kind of stuff. I don't know, maybe somebody was singing. I'm not sure. Uh, but why don't we stand together, and we'll open our service in a, a word of, of prayer, and uh, we'll start with hymn number 460, uh, 416, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Good to see you this morning. I trust you had a great week, and you're ready to worship the Lord this morning. As uh, we're going back to Ezra chapter 3, and uh, looking forward to that this morning. Please be in mighty prayer. You know, it's a, I was talking with some of the fellows this morning, even that uh, it is a big responsibility. Anytime you preach or teach, you're bringing forth God's word. And uh, sometimes the slightest things can change things in your own spirit and things like that. And uh, you, uh, the first question you ask, Lord, is it me? Do I need to get something right? Uh, then you start saying, okay, Lord, whatever it is, I, it needs to be clarity. Uh, it can be the difference between running a race and a pair of nice sneakers that are meant for running or putting on a pair of work boots. And uh, some of you guys can still run fast in work boots, but the guy wearing the shoes is probably going to do a little bit better. Uh, they're designed for that. And uh, you don't want any kind of hindrance or anything like that when you're preaching. And so I certainly do appreciate those prayers uh, during that time of preaching. But let's gather together in prayer, shall we? Our Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together this morning. We're asking that you would meet with us in a mighty way. We're asking that the Spirit of God would open our eyes and open our hearts and uh, illumine to us the truth of thy word. Give us receptive hearts that we might be able to receive truth. And that not only would that we would receive it, but we would do something about it. Lord, this morning I pray as we read about the foundation that is being rebuilt, uh, we would think about the foundation in our own life. I think of how my life is built in Christ. And Lord, I just pray uh, that you would continue to work in my life and build upon that foundation and and allow me to grow in your grace and knowledge. I pray this morning that you would be with those that are, that are sick this morning, that are unable to be here. I pray that you would touch them in a mighty way. Continue to be with our country, with what's going on in the political scene and with uh, uh, illnesses and sicknesses and all those types of things. And I pray that you meet needs, Lord. I pray that you comfort families. I pray, uh, Father, that you would be a present help in this time of trouble. And Lord, I pray no matter what happens in our life, that we continue to look unto Jesus as the author and finish of our faith. I pray this morning that you bless Brother Arp as he's off at Faustoria. Uh, be with our young people as they'll be back later on in the, this morning, uh, hearing the word of God uh, back in junior church. I pray that you would continue working their life. And I pray that you would use us this morning as we lift our voices in praise to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number 416, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Hail the power of Jesus' name. 
I'm glad that I don't need an argument of my own goodness, my own righteousness, but I can say, hey, I am, I am, I am uh, guilt-free. I am on my way to heaven because of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Aren't you glad that's your testimony this morning? If that is not your testimony, if this morning you're trusting in something else, please give your life to the Lord. Trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. He's done the work. Receive the gift this morning. Hymn number 12, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Seated. Brother Chuck's going to come and let us know what's going on in the life and ministry of our church. Did everybody get a bulletin this morning? Anybody did not get a bulletin that would like one this morning? We'd like to get some people to get you one. Good, everyone? All right, good. Amen. All right, let's do this. Good morning. All right, you guys have done better, but that's all right. That's okay. I'll let it go. I understand. There you go. Hey, there you go. Thanks, Mr. Balak, for picking up the back. Thank you. All right, uh, if you'd open your bulletin with me here, we'll go over a few things going on. Uh, first of all, with uh, Food Pantry here, which is not your bulletin, but I'll tell you that there, we served uh, 66 families, we had four new families, and we had 248 uh, individuals served. So thank you to all those that uh, work hard on that and uh, fill the gap and unload the truck and all these things. And uh, um, I did not look this morning. I was talking with somebody, so I did not get back there. But uh, you can see what's in the back there after the service and see what's back there for you. Little bread and a little bit of what? A little bit of bread and a little bit of grapes. A little bread and a little grapes. There you go. There you go. Biblically. Like biblical times. You know, some grapes and some bread kind of stuff. But there you go. The mold is healthy, all right? That's, uh, that's uh, antibiotic there. All right. So uh, we have Trail Life. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting uh, Trail Life here coming up. Uh, so our first open house for our new troop will be January 21st at 6.30 p.m., and I'll be here at the church, and uh, it's open to all boys ages 5 through 17, and any men who would like to... Uh, Volunteer to help out. You can see uh, Brother Aaron about that, and he'll give you a little more information as far as uh, what uh, qualifications for that are and things and, and what roles we need for uh, to fill the gap there. I uh, just encourage you to come see what it's about if you'd like. Uh, capital Commission, please be in prayer for and guidance on how God wants you to contribute toward the Capital uh, Commission and uh, just uh, this uh, our church and just trying to work towards paying those things off. Uh, it's uh, one of the goals this year for just trying to uh, take care of that and just get that out of the way. So, um, anyway, please continue to pray about that matter. A business meeting will be coming up. It'll be held on January 31st, uh, 31st, and the meeting will commence shortly after the evening service. All right, so that's our business meeting coming up there. 
Uh, and then um, uh, Noah Stevens will be preaching tonight, so I encourage you to please come tonight. It'll be his last service that he'll be with us, uh, probably, right? Wednesdays maybe, but probably this would be it. Okay, so uh, anyway, but I encourage you to come out, support him, and uh, be in prayer. If you can't be here, please be in prayer for him uh, about that tonight, and I'm sure he'll do a great job as he's been preparing for quite some time for it, so looking forward to hearing that. Uh, and then just continue to pray for our Bible and college students that are uh, going back to school and are back at school and just... Uh, reaching out to them and just let them know that, uh, you know, even though they're not here, that we're still with them in spirit and we think about them. So please uh, keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And the addresses are on the back there in the fellowship hall between the bathrooms and uh, by the water fountain. If you'd like to uh, write them a letter or uh, send them a gift or anything like that, you can feel free to do that. And then I uh, just encourage you to follow us on social media and the podcast and be in prayer for uh, this week's uh, our, the outreach ministry, junior church, and the Sunday school teachers. Thank you. Yes, Adam, I will. You didn't hear him ask. He said he wanted me to explain a little better the Capital Commission, and I told Brother Chuck I was going to do that. So um, so we've been uh, just kind of brainstorming some ideas. If you notice, when you walk in, there was the uh, post-up stand banner out there uh, that had uh, the Capital Commission on there. And obviously, the uh, what's the main focus is paying our building off. You see a design of sorts up there, what potentially could be, but it's not necessarily what we're going to do. Just kind of gives you a vision of what uh, you know could be like if we did something that to that uh, sort. Um, but mainly the biggest thing is focusing on trying to pay our building off and then prayerfully considering whatever we're going to do in the future. So step one, we crawl, then we walk, then we run, that type of thing, okay? Uh, and so we were just pray been praying about uh, how to do some things and to tie it into, obviously, uh, making the Capital Commission even something of a scriptural donation basis on how we would do it. And so we've been thinking of different clubs you could come up with. And what we're going to do is on, in the, uh, on the 31st, we have our business meeting day is when we're going to kind of get all that stuff uh, put together. We've been uh, working on more things, getting the tickets ready and all that stuff. And I just want to make sure it's all finished and we don't have to add any last minute stuff. But we've been thinking some different things. So we want to have uh, what's called the Little Lads Club. And uh, that would be $52. That's a dollar a week. And that would be the five loaves and two fishes. I know five and two doesn't equal 52. Uh, but when you put the numbers together, it looks like 52, right? And uh, so it would be $52. It'd be a dollar a week. And that's uh, what we're trying to do is we want 100% participation. That is everybody, every body that's breathing in this building. Yes, even that one. And uh, we, we want, and so this way, everybody has a part in the, in uh, paying the building off. And so our little ads club is $52 for the year. $52 slowed on Richard. $52 for the year, and that is uh, um, just a dollar a week. Uh, then we have the uh, Gideon's Club, which is $300 for a week, and then we have the Gideon's Plus Club, which is $300 a month. Uh, and then we have a couple of their other clubs, which is the Multitude Club, that'd be $5,000 on the year, uh, the mul Fed the Multitude, $5,000. Uh, the Pentecost Club, Club, which would be about $3,000. They had Peter preach, and 3,000 souls were saved. Uh, we have the Hebrews Club, which is actually uh, what the average American spends on coffee and fast food in a week. And so basically, it's basically giving those luxuries up on the Hebrews Club. Uh, that was actually Adam's idea, so that I just I thought was a really good idea. And, uh, you know, so we have, a, we have a couple other ones that we're finishing up, but that kind of gives you an idea of what it is. And so you can kind of attach yourself to that, uh, take the ticket, put it in, uh, uh, you keep the uh, uh, small stub. It'll say on there, there's all kinds of directions on the ticket. You take a little stub and you put it back in the offering thing. You keep the, uh, I'm sorry, you put the big ticket in the stub thing, and then you put, keep the little stub for yourself. Uh, as a reminder of what you promised. So just like faith promise, and it's all based upon, you know, faith giving, things like that. It's not, uh, you're not getting a bill, nothing like that. It's just between you and the Lord. So it gives you a couple more weeks to pray about it, and then we'll get those tickets out, and that way you can kind of grab them. And then what they'll be is they'll be in the fellowship hall. There's a little white board back there, um, uh, one of those push boards, and all the tickets will be on there. And there'll also be another a paper on the wall that'll explain what the clubs are, how much they are, any other further instructions. So that way, if you have any questions, it'll all be back there by uh, the board. And the whole point is to try to see what we can get. Uh, I'd love to have this building paid off this year. That would be fantastic. We, I think we owe just about 47,000 for the building. And uh, we just have to make some decisions on uh, what we're gonna do after that. And that would be a great thing. I think it'd be very encouraging to be able to get this, uh, get this paid off. And then we can keep what we budgeted for the building payment, keep going into the building, building even if it's paid off. And that way we can start building up uh, equity on if uh, whenever the Lord leads us in that direction to do something, whatever that would be. Uh, and so we're just super uh, excited about that. And we've been talking about it for many, many years. And <laughs> I've been talking about it for a couple years with the Capital Commission. We just have never, just never had peace to kind of release that dog yet. And so now it's released. And so we're going to try to focus on it. And the Lord knows, the Lord knew all that stuff. Last year was when we were supposed to launch it, but obviously with COVID and everything, probably wouldn't have been the greatest. And so the Lord knew that. Uh, that's why he never gave us peace last year to do it. And so this year we are our full steam ahead, even though we have no idea what else is coming, but 
the Lord gave us peace, so he must know something's going on. So that's good, and we're glad for that. Um, you'll get, you can get a paper, uh, two papers you're able to get today. One, if you are a gentleman that you believe you are qualified to be a deacon, and that's something you'd like to uh, put your name in for, there are papers back there that look just like this, and it's a questionnaire going from the scriptures, and these are yes and no questions. If there's a, uh, you can go through it. If you get to a no, I will ask you why it's a no, uh, but basically, if it's a no, it's then you're basically admitting like, hey, it's a qualification I don't have, and then obviously uh, that you wouldn't, you'd find out that, hey, maybe I'm not there for a deacon. So, but this is just biblically what is qualified. So what is a deacon to do? A deacon is there to assist the pastor, assist the work that's going on. That's what scripture says, and uh, that's what a deacon does. And so, um, you know, you're not there doing endless monotonous jobs and things like that. It's not there to you know, lord over people. It's there to assist the pastor, exactly what it is. And uh, so um, you can look at that in scripture and we'll have all that. But anyway, I'd encourage you to, to fill that out if you are somebody that would like to do that and uh, you feel you're qualified and you'll know uh, scripturally by the time you get done with your questionnaire. We have some other scripture that goes with it as well, but that would be uh, step two uh, in like interview process and all that. And so with the deacons, we are not gonna be voting any deacons in on the 31st. We're basically gonna decide what we're going to do uh, from based upon people that are qualified or not qualified. Uh, and then we'll go from there on January 31st, we're gonna decide what we're going to do there and then we'll move forward from there, all right? Also, there'll be a paper that Noah will pass out to you uh, towards the end or somebody will pass at you after, after service. And it's going to have the uh, constitutional amendment we have on there. Uh, there was a word left out, but it actually changes the whole entire like meaning of this, uh, uh, of this uh, um, section in our constitution the word not is left out <laughs> and so now it gives you allowance to do this and that's it's no bueno and uh i, I asked um, lighthouse legal ministries and they kind of directed me in the way i need to go with that and so we're going to vote on that and then there's another thing on their constitution and basically we're going to be taking a vote on fixing any punctuation marks okay that's all it is so we're not take, changing anything else uh, as far as i see um, and there is only one other thing we'd have to vote on changing and that is a uh, messed up reference it's uh, they put acts 18 18 is supposed to be acts 18 8 and they hit a one instead of like a colon and so we would definitely have to vote on that since it's a scripture change uh, other than that everything else is punctuation uh, like e they have equals marks instead of colons uh, or a dash or whatever s stuff like that nothing that changes like the the doctrine of it or whatever and so that'll be on that paper as well and so uh, that all that information of that will be on there. Uh, other offices that we're going to have to vote on, uh, that'll be on there as well. Uh, and so get one of those right after service, so that way you have you have it two weeks before uh, the business meeting, and you'll know how and prayerfully be ready for all that vote. And that'll be at, right after the evening service. So be praying for our church, and uh, be ready uh, for any questions, concerns, rebuttals, refusals. Also, you'll get a copy of the proposed uh, budget for next year. And I do have to give out an amendment sheet to the fellas. Um, I was pleasantly wrong on how much came in last year for tithe. Um, I went back and was checking all my numbers and everything because that's what you do. And one of the, all my charts I made up every month that had a fifth week, I forgot to auto calculate that fifth week. That's a good problem to have. <laughs> that's a good problem to have. So it's, uh, it's uh, several thousand dollars higher, which means we're actually up compared to the last couple years in tithe and offering during COVID. That's a good thing to have. That's a good problem to have. Uh, now our spending is way down just because we weren't able to do things. So it looks like less money came through, but in tithe and offering, more money came in this year than the past previous years. Now I will say 2018, we were, were down from 2018, but that was the year we did that $10,000 fundraiser and we got the $10,000 in. So, you know, outside of the fundraiser for tithe and offering, uh, we're up considerably. So that's good. So I praise the Lord for that because, you know, you don't ever want to go the other direction. Uh, if you're trying to run a ministry, amen. So, but anyway, I'll get all that information out to you fellas uh, um, ASAP, um, but that is nothing that necessarily need to be voted on. It's just kind of a word of encouragement for our church, all right? Other than that, keep an uh, update to date, up to date, <laughs> up to date with what's going on in the life and ministry of our church. Uh, Lord willing, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be figuring out exactly what we want to do with uh, teen life, getting that kicked off again. Uh, and uh, trying to get our young people work with and uh, Paul and Shelby and Josh they're working hard uh, with our young people trying to get all that stuff built up and uh, so Lord willing we'll be kicking something off here real, real soon uh, with our, our teens might be kind of like a soft launch but we'll still be doing something with them and uh, just be praying uh, in uh, the second week of February I have to go down to uh, Columbus to get ready for our camp meeting to s decide what we're going to be doing this year for camp uh, we are planning on going back to Kobiak this year. However, I will have a, a contingent plan in, in case they shut down Michigan again uh, or burn it down, whatever you decide. Uh, and uh, 
I think I think Michigan is actually a dumpster fire posing as a state, but whatever. But anyway, uh, so we will have a contingency plan for our teenagers to what, no matter what, we'll go we'll go to camp. It's either going to be up in Michigan or it's going to be somewhere else, uh, TBD. All right. Uh, we have a good idea where that's going to be at, but again, we're limited to what they uh, what is going to be open and what's not open and things like that. Okay. All right. <laughs> I got a lot more talking to do, so I better get back to singing. All right. Hymn number 42. Stand with me, please. Hymn number 42. I will sing of my Redeemer. As soon as we start the song, we'll have our young people head back to the back with uh, David and them, all those that are working to your church. I will sing of my Redeemer and his one. verses 1 and 3, hymn 109, Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you. 
beautiful singing. What a great truth. God is so faithful, isn't he? I'm so glad for his faithfulness, his love, his care, keeping for our life. I'm glad that he decides to use us in spite of, well, us. Amen. <laughs> I'm just thankful for his love and mercy and his grace. Take the word of God, please, and go with me to Ezra. But keep your Bible handy. We're going to be traveling all sorts of places today as we speak about a one-word topic today. I apologize. There's no slides. Uh, I think I changed my topic and changed, I don't know, the Lord was uh, doing something interesting and uh, gave me at least direction for where I knew we were at, but just where the Lord in my heart was at. I just really was begging the Lord, and many of you know kind of where that is just because I've asked you to pray and direction, but one word he's put in my heart. And that's what we're going to preach this morning. That word is together. Together. We find the children of Israel now, they're returning from, they have returned now from their exile, and they, are, they built the altar, and they established the, the priority of what they wanted to be known as or what uh, they wanted God to know about them is that the altar was preeminent, and God is preeminent. And so now we find them after the altar, the sacrifice are going, the offerings being burned, and that is all taking place now. And after seven months of collecting materials, we find that they are going to be now building the foundation. Not the whole temple. We know that's going to take a lot longer uh, to get complete because of uh, some uh, adversity they'll, they'll come against. But they're building the foundation. And just the foundation is going to bring about great joy, but it's also going to bring great sorrow to some people. It's an interesting thing that we get to see in Ezra chapter 3, the power of perspective. The power of perspective. You have these old saints that you'll see at the end, they're weeping because this foundation was built and of what, it, what it used to mean and what it doesn't mean. And then you have this younger generation, most likely born in the exile, who have never been able to worship God in that way. And they can only see what it is and it, what it could be and what it will be. Boy, what the power of perspective. But the thing we notice from the very beginning of this chapter to the end of it is that the, the sense of togetherness that they have here. It says that at the very beginning, it says they were, went out as one man, right? We talked about that last week. They went out as one man. But we'll see that same exact theme going on. But this laying a foundation is no easy or simple project. It was something that was of, of great labor. And when you think of the toil and labor that goes into building a foundation, a foundation is something that is arduous work and sometimes unseen or thankless work. How often do you go, if you don't have a leak in your foundation, you go down and go, man, that's a great looking foundation. Do you see those cinder blocks? They look great. Let me just get a shovel and dig it up again just so I could admire the foundation. No, no, no. <laughs> it's something that there is something you don't often think about. When I walk in my house, I don't, the first thing I say is, man, this foundation is great. No, I say, man, it's cold in here. Who left the, who left the window open? You know, <laughs> what's that on the floor? <laughs> How'd that thing fall off the wall? You know, we know it's exterior things, but it's the faith and trust that we have in the foundation not to collapse is really what keeps the house up, Right? And so this foundation that they're going to build is going to take a lot of labor, a lot of trial. It is going to be a, a hard work. These blocks or the things they're going to be putting in place for the foundation, we're not thinking of small one-man moving cinder blocks. These are mighty, mighty boulders, mighty huge things. This is a, a essential for what is going to be the temple that they're going to build. If we recap, we see that the children of Israel are out of exile now. They are having rebuilt the altar, they're reestablishing their worship with God, their feasts are being practices, sacrifices are being offered, and they're going to begin to rebuild the temple. Now we know the first temple was designed by uh, King David, it was built by King Solomon. And now they believe this was the home of the God of the universe. In the sense of the whole point of this earthly temple is it is a place that overlaps God's heavenly home. It's where God lives and rules of all creation. But Solomon even knows that it isn't a place that contains God, nor could it. It says in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. In other words, it's just a symbol. And really, if you look at the story of creation, the story of the Bible is that creation shows that all of creation is his temple in the sense. It's a place where God desires to dwell, and he desired to dwell with man. We see that in the Garden of Eden, right? He walked with Adam and Eve and, and uh, allows us to have a relationship with God. Why? Because he wants to dwell with us. He wants us to have that relationship with him. And so this was an essential place. We especially see it in the Garden of Eden. Eden means delight. So in the center of the garden, we see God's delight. That is God residing or his presence residing with his creation. So 
God's delight, in essence, would be that he wants to dwell with mankind. This is why the, the temple was designed after the Garden of Eden. It has many floral things and patter, uh, golden things, and the, the, uh, um, the menorah symbolizes the tree of life. It is all a sense of that God desires to dwell with his creation. Now, in the temple of Israel, priests and Levites were to do what? They were to do the work and to keep the temple, right? Isn't that similar to the instruction that God gave original man in the Garden of Eden? That we are to work, we are to subdue. So similar to some instructions that God has given to us. But the interesting thing from the time of Genesis till the time of now, man has rebelled against that instruction, haven't they? In the Garden of Eden, God says, hey, this you can do all this, you can have all this, but the one thing you cannot have. And, and mankind rebelled against God's design. And then we say the children of Israel go in the promised land and they're in the promised land and they say you need to follow these things and do these things and they took it upon themselves to instead of letting God rule them, they decided to rule themselves, didn't they? Which allowed them to end up in captivity. And the first temple that they had made is now destroyed. But God, I love this theme and the story of what this is, is God is a God of second chances, isn't he? Not that he looks past what you have done. Not that he says, well, it's okay. You can do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. That's not the theme of the Bible. He's saying, I'm going to be merciful on you who does not deserve it so you can have the opportunity to still live and bring honor and glory to me. And so when they're going back to this temple is to rebuild it. They're having this opportunity to, again, make God essential or invite the presence of him into their life brings us to their return. It's all about the rebuilding. It's a time, it should be a time of encouragement. They were in exile and God used somebody like King Cyrus to bring them out of their captivity. Not only bring them out of captivity, but also to fund a portion of the building. So for these people, it should be an encouragement that they're no longer in this exile. They are there and they have the opportunity to, to give their worship to God and they build this altar. They have the opportunity to build this, rebuild this temple and to get back to a sense of pure worship to the Lord in a sense. That should bring encouragement, right? Knowing that God says, I want to bring to you or give to you restoration. And I'm glad that you and I can read the scriptures today and we can read the same things that they're going to give praise to God for in a moment, that his mercies are new every day. And as we sang that song, great is thy faithfulness. His faithfulness is great to us. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. And that's the truth. And it was no different for them in the sense that God was always providing. God had always met their needs and God had always protected them. And I want you to notice too, by the way, not to get way ahead of myself by a couple weeks, but do you notice that God had them build the altar first, not the walls? Do you notice he had him build the temple second, not the walls? See, because in essence what they're saying is, God, you are my protection. To build the walls was to say, hey, let's protect ourselves first, then we'll build God's stuff. But I love the divine order of how all this is taking place. Build the altar first. Go to rebuild the temple. But they're doing it together. We notice in verse number eight, it says, now in the second year, of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem. In the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons, by the way, different Jeshua. You'll find him in, in uh, uh, chapter 2, I believe, verse uh, is it 42 or 62? Something like that. It's back in verse 42, different Jeshua. But anyway, uh, with the sons of his brethren, uh, Ketamil and his sons and the sons of Judah together to set forward the work, uh, workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad, with their sons and their brethren and Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising the giving and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good, 
for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house when the foundation of his house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. I want to say that a voice, voices that are together is a voice that can be heard afar off. Our goal, our desire in our life as believers, if you are saved and born again, you have the Spirit of God indwelling in you, your goal should be to be in unity with God, first and foremost, which would make you in unity with mankind to allow the influence of the gospel message, not your influence, but the influence of the gospel message to go as far as possible. And we're seeing here that they have, the interesting thing about their, their unity is they became an exile because of their unity, because they all decided to rebel against God. But he gives us this opportunity to rebuild. And I love the emphasis they have here of being together. I don't want to tell you that first and foremost, you need to be better together first and foremost with Christ. If any man be in Christ, together, in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Paul expressed, to, for me to live is Christ. Ephesians speaks about being in Christ. Synonymous. I'm an ambassador for Christ. That means that my life is together with the testimony of my salvation. It's inseparable. You don't have your Christian life on Sunday and then your regular life Monday through Saturday. It's together. And this is the testimony to bring about. We built this altar together to worship the Lord together. We're building this temple together to worship the Lord together. And our voices of praise together reaches afar off. And so let's pray and ask God to bless in this message this morning. Give us wisdom. May the Spirit of God give us wisdom this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to hear your word preached. We thank you for the word of God. We're asking this morning that you would knit our hearts together, first and foremost to thee, Lord. That the Spirit of God would open our eyes to wondrous truths. That you would reveal in us any wicked way. That you would soften our hearts towards the gospel message. And Father, I pray this morning that if there is anybody here this morning that has never been saved, they've never trusted Christ as their personal Savior, they have never repented of their sin, they've never accepted the free gift of salvation, may today be the day of salvation. And work in their heart, Father, they might be together, one with you, Lord. Not just here, but after you come for your children in heaven for all of eternity. Bless now, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. This rebuilding process should thrill your soul and my soul, knowing that God gives us this opportunity to come back and rebuild, but he doesn't say to just rebuild and go on as you were. Really, he gives a sentiment, even though this is an Old Testament account, we can see the New Testament principle of John chapter 8 and verse 11, when the woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus begins to write in the sand what he wrote. We don't know specifically, maybe their sins or whatever the case may be, but he writes in the sand and they all leave, don't they? And he says, where is thine accuser? He said in verse 11, when he tells her, he says, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. That is the process of rebuilding that God desires for us. That yes, you had a life that was destroyed. You had a testimony because of bad choices. The temple was restored, destroyed but I'm going to give you an opportunity to rebuild. I'm going to give you an opportunity to rebuild, but the whole rebuilding is not so you can go and do dumb things again or going back to your sinful life and say, well, you know, I'm nobody's perfect. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. It's to go and sin no more. I would say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results, right? It's interesting how we will live our own way in our own way that we want to live outside of God's premise, but we expect somehow God to magically change it. That's insanity. To try to do things our way, but expect God to bless it. We often use this illustration, or I do anyway, you probably don't in your life because you're not weird like me, but, uh, you know, it's, 
we eat a Cheeto and pray, pray for God to change it into a carrot on the way down, you know? It just doesn't work that way. We can't live our life however we want and then come to Sunday and it's a spiritual southern bless your heart and everything's okay and you go away. You say, well, God says his mercies are new every day, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to jump off a cliff Cliff, say, well, if it's my time to go, I'm going to go, but if not, God's going to give me wings. Well, I'll see you in the afterlife, brother, <laughs> you know? He says, I'm saving you, I'm, I'm forgiving you that you might have new life in Christ. We're supposed to have a, a separated life. And that means that anything that is contrary in this world to God's character, his word, his promises, his work, stay away from it. If it's contrary to those things, stay away from it. And if you're in those things, repent of it. Get forgiveness and begin to rebuild. I want to show you a couple things that we see in Scripture this morning about how they stayed together in this rebuilding process. In verses 8 and 9, we see that they stood together. They stood together. The work is being done, and we, said, we read just a verse, verse or two before that, that they had hired skilled laborers to come in and do this building and do the foundational work. Now, let me tell you something. It is essential that you get the right workers for the job. Uh, and the same as for the work of God's work here. You don't just put bodies there because they're a body and they can do something. They have to be qualified. Same as with uh, deacons and things like that. You wouldn't just want anybody. You want somebody that is spirit-led, somebody that is biblically qualified, somebody that has a heart for the ministry and heart to serve the Lord. You want the very best, right? Right? <laughs> when you're picking a basketball team, you ain't get to picking the guy with uh, crutches and a cast on. You're not picking the guy with three, oh, three legs. That'd be actually kind of fast, but I'm like two legs. I was thinking of a dog, you know. No, you're going to pick the one that's the best. You know, if you have a cho choice between picking between Chris Baylog and LeBron James, I mean, character-wise, I'd take Chris, but I mean, basketball-wise, I'm going to take Bron Bron every time. You know, he's a good basketball player. I would still take Michael Jordan over LeBron, but you know, but that's just me. A battle for the ages, right? But you're going to get, you want to get the very, very best. God sent his very best to redeem you and I. And he says, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you have the very best. And so we ought to serve God as the very best. So they got these skilled workers, these skilled laborers, people that are going to be able to lay this foundation without any worry of it being off or, or the temple having a chance to, to collapse or, or not being sturdy workmanship. Get the right people for the right job. But they stood together. It says in verse 9, it says, Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God of, at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Now, I will tell you, originally, when I read this word set forward, I looked it up in a dictionary which was my mistake, first of all, by the way. I looked up in a dictionary, and it says to begin a journey. I'm like, wow, that's like just made for a Bible illustration, and that's great points to flow into. But then I did the smart thing and looked up their definition of it in, like, the Hebrew and Greek, and it doesn't mean that. <laughs> and so we'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, but it's still, in the sense of it is, the, the whole journey still gives truth there, but that's not where we're going with it. I'm like not going to take it out of context or anything like that just to prove a point, okay, just so you want to know the safety there, all right? Uh, but they stood together in what? The first thing we see is they stood together in the work. They stood together in the work. Uh, they were all working with these skilled laborers, and it says specifically here, anybody that was 20 years and upward, which is interesting because before, uh, when they were building, it was 30 years and upward, and then certain tasks, they would say 25 years and upward. This is not going contradictory against it, but it's basically saying on this, uh, for lack of better words, just the grunt work of building on the outside, they say that these, basically the young men should be carrying that labor, working in the workforce. Lamentations 3, 27 says this, it's good for a man that be to bear the yoke in his youth. In other words, uh, the young men should be stepping up and doing this labor and using the physical ability that they have. I think of the average football player uh, retires by like 35 years old uh, to me being 40 years old. I'm like, that's young. Uh, when, I, when I was 18, I'm like, 35, oh man, nursing home bound, you know. Uh, but uh, you want the young guys, you want these young strapping guys. And so it is that 20 years and upwards. In other words, they're saying the young guys need to work together, use the strength of your youth, take that, that, that yoke on of working together. But let me tell you something. Not only if you're going to say the 20-year-old workers there, they had these skilled workers. They have to be trained. They have to be taught. 
They might be standing together to work, but if they don't know what they're doing, what's going to get accomplished? Uh, I always laughed when I worked at a, a job, and many of you guys can attest to this. You have people that are really good at training somebody how to do their job, right? Uh, I always made a joke, and I just told my wife this. And I don't know if she's never heard it before. It's been so long I said it that she forgot about it. But I always used to tell people when, you come to, when I worked at Cracker Barrel, I say they'd send you to this lady to train you how to do your job. Then they'd send you to me to learn how to love your job, enjoy your job. And, uh, you know, I think that's the important thing. It's like, listen, we have training. Uh, we can train other people in, in certain things. Like some guys are, are really just super knowledgeable. Sometimes I feel about as dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to certain things. But they can help me with that. They can encourage me in things that maybe I'm weak in. But let me tell you one thing I can help you do. I can help you enjoy the journey. You know why? Because I enjoy the journey. I enjoy living my Christian life. I enjoy watching God uh, take biblical truth and live it in my life. I love knowing that, hey, God told me to do these things. And I love even when he says, hey, you need to make these things right. And you go to that person because why? You get a front row seat to restoration. I love living my Christian life. I am confident in the fact that I can help. I'm not saying I'm doing everything right. I'm not saying I'm a perfect example. If I did, you need to lock me up in loony bin. But what I'm saying is I love living for the Lord. I love to be able to do my very best to live what, what he said to do. And so to me, it's vital. This is an area in my life. I want to say, hey, listen, the Christian life isn't bad. It's great. There's great joy in it. And I want to bring you along to show you the, the joy you can have by serving the Lord. You think working for the president would be cool. Well, I, mean, I mean, whatever, we'll stay over that. But I'm saying, you know, I'm saying like, you think of your most great job you could have you get to serve the Lord. And that brings a smile to my face. That brings joy, great joy to me to know that I can serve the Lord. Not only that, but I love seeing other people that joy serving the Lord. I believe really, honestly, the reason that a lot of the work for the Lord doesn't get done is because people don't enjoy serving the Lord. Why? I don't, I can't, I don't know. I mean, I know why it could happen because we're people. We get irritated. The things of life bog us down. This is why God has given us his written word. So when you are frustrated, when you are discouraged, you can go to his word and let him comfort you who's never changed. And I want to tell you that has been the, and it's, it's so funny because we say it, we tell it, we told the teenagers for years. I hear it in junior church. And I feel sometimes as adults and myself included, I don't even take my own advice. You hear somebody, hey, oh man, you need to cling close to God, get in his word and read it. And then I walk around, I'm like, whoa, man, what's going on? And as soon as I do my devotions, I'm like, man, I feel so much greater. Why? Because the, the Spirit of God gave me peace. Uh, sometimes the Spirit of God says, that's you, idiot. Fix it. You know? Take your own advice. Enjoy the journey. But they stood together in the work. There was work to do. Matthew 28 tells us that, and it gives a great commission. He says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing, teaching them about the Lord, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. So don't just teach them about how to get saved and that they need to get baptized and they need to do this and that, but teach them how to observe and how to live. Listen, we, we stop. It's like people got saved. Amen, they got baptized. And they're behind you the rest of your life. You're like, oh yeah, them guys, okay, great. Whatever happened to them? No, saved, baptized, discipled. Bring them along. Help them out. Because guess what? You ever seen, uh, uh, you know, if you've ever worked in a factory, a newbie comes in, and some of those guys are like, yeah, fresh meat. Let's mech with it. What's the first thing they tell them to go get, guys? Hey, go get the pallet stretcher, right? Good. And the guy looks around for 20, 30 minutes looking for a pallet stretcher that doesn't exist, you know? It's like fresh meat in the water. Listen, Satan's the same exact way. Fine, you got saved fresh meat. I'm going to pounce on you and discourage you. I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your testimony and get you out of church. But if you've got somebody that's going to bring you along and help you work together, they have a whole lot better chance of surviving. So they stood together for the work. And they have to have somebody that's willing to, uh, to, to uh, help them along. Just like the foundation being built was no simple task, Building somebody up in their faith and helping them along and discipling, discipling them is no simple task. It takes work. It takes patience. It takes long-suffering. It takes love. It takes gentleness. It takes meekness. That sounds really familiar. I've heard that somewhere. Galatians 5, I believe. As a Christian, the fruit of the Spirit 
is what helps us along when we're discipling people. And when we're discipling people, shouldn't we use the Spirit of God <laughs> when we're trying to lead them along? So we, they stood together in the work that they were doing. They were, in other words, the skilled laborers. Our foundation being in Christ. This is how we're built up. Go to, with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I love this setting of scripture. Any of you guys that have preached before, you understand the struggle it is. You want to use one verse, and you keep going back, and keep going back, and keep going back. You're like, well, just whatever. I'll use this whole section. That's what happens sometimes, you know? But it's all good stuff, amen? Let the word of God dwell in you richly, amen? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But my foundation is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse number 11. It says, wherefore, remember. This is interesting, isn't it? Wherefore, remember. As believers, we have an awfully short memory, don't we? Short memory of God's mercy. Children of Israel did it, right? That's why they're out murmuring all the time. God took their need and they started murmuring about it. While well, they still had the quail in their teeth, murmuring it. They were murmuring and complaining. How many times you and I forgot about the blessings of the Lord? How many of you, you and I, have forgotten about the blessings of one another? We do have short memories. Because I think our, 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 our mind and our hearts are tinged toward the negative. I, I always say, I'm, there's times, I don't know how many times, if you talk to me long enough, you'll know, I'm, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't be negative like that. And you, I'm sure you've heard me say that. Because it's just sometimes it's like your natural go-to. You just like, you start talking about something, next thing you know you're talking about negative things. And I hate that about myself. So I have to repent to the Lord, get right with the people that heard it. It's just such a process. I wish I just wasn't so stubborn and not have to go back and ask for forgiveness all the time. But anyway, let's keep going. Thank you for the counseling. I appreciate it. You're helping me tremendously. But uh, that you be, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by the which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, notice that, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and, and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all are build, building, who, whom all, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Man, what great truth that I am building up in that, that I was alienated, I was a, I was a foreigner, I, was, I, would, I did not belong. I was like that Sesame Street episode, one of these things doesn't belong. But by the Spirit of God, I was drawn nigh, I was brought together. I was made one, I was made whole by the blood of Christ. I'm thankful for that. The work needs to be done, and it's essential that God's people who are carrying out God's work stand together for the work. John chapter 9, verse 4 says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Listen, if you're waiting for your deathbed thinking that's the end of life, then you are not living a life of expectancy because we don't know when that day is going to come. You have no idea when Christ is going to come back. People that are waiting to get saved on their deathbed, please tell me when that's going to be. Actually, don't tell me because I don't want to live in paranoia counting down the days. But you don't know when the Lord's going to come back or when you're going to die. But they stood together to work. They stood together to watch. That word set forward, as I said, wasn't a journey, but it meant the overseers. They set forward the men to, to look over the workmen, and the workmen looked over the job that was going to be done, and they were ensuring that the job was getting done right and getting done in a timely fashion. There was expectation of how the work should be done. That's what we're seeing, right? Uh, something in, as important as the temple, as the foundation of the temple they're going to build would not be just left flippantly to anybody. 
Not only did they get hired laborers, but they also had people to oversee it to make sure it was properly built. Pastor Sexton always says this. He says, don't expect what you don't inspect. In other words, if you're not willing to check on it, don't expect to end out the way you want it to end. If you're not willing to go back and to make sure it's done right, how many parents would give your kid an ax or a chainsaw and say, have at her, son, and go inside and watch football? Uh Uh-uh. Then he'd have a new name, Stumpy. It wouldn't be good. No, you, you stand out there and you show them how to hold it and you, you watch them. And I know sometimes kids, or, or, and this will be likened to spiritual immaturity, they go, I'm fine. I'm not going to hurt myself, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't talk to my dad like that because I wouldn't be alive today. <laughs> I'd be in the presence of Jesus a lot faster. But I'm just telling you that that's our attitude. Like if somebody's an overseer over something, don't look at it as if, what's their problem? Why are they always lurking? Because they need to watch over it to make sure it gets done right because they're going to be accountable for what's being done. And so they stood together to work and they stood together to watch. Next thing we see is they sang together. They sang together. If you go back to Ezra, and so the foundation is built now and and as soon as the foundation gets built, they don't even wait for the whole temple to be built and they begin to start praising. They suit up in their garments and and we find out that there was order in their worship. There was order in their worship. Now, this doesn't mean that they were stiff and rigid and how they had to do it, but there were some essential things. Let's put on our clothes and let's get, as it was ordered in the time of David, let's get out our symbols and let's get out everything that they did then and let's make sure we're offering proper praise to the Lord. It was done in order. It was done with a sense of priority. It was done with a sense of care. It was done with a sense of reverence that we're going to worship God God's way and we're going to present our worship to him how he wants it. This isn't some kind of flippant talent show that we're just going to go out and show God our pipes. We're not going to gyrate for Jesus. We're not going to shake for the Savior. We're like giving something in order, in praise, and in worship to him, something that brings honor and glory. But music and singing does several things for us. First of all, it shows that we obey. What happens when we sing? We obey. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He's telling you that the word of Christ must dwell in you richly. And out of that word dwelling in you gives you a song to sing. Now I'm not going to say that you're going to sound good when you sing because I know I don't, but it will produce a song. The reason some of us don't have a song is because maybe we don't have the Savior. If you don't have the Savior, how are you going to have a new song? I sing it all the time. Poor Scott Gross. I got my earmuffs on, pound and post. I'm out there singing the praises of Zion. Couldn't help it, you know? It's like that kid that can't sit still or like that pastor that can't sit still. I can't. It's just twitchy, you know? It's like my spirit. I cannot help but sing. There's something in there. But when I sing, I'm being obedient. The word of Christ is dwelling in me richly. When something's rich, it overflows and it bubbles out. As a Christian, that's the way we should be. And they sang together. They, uh, not only does it show that we obey, but it shows that we dig deep roots in God's word. That, that phrase, dwell in you richly. It means it's not just a verse you read that morning, but you're mulling it over. It's resonating so much in your heart and your life that it flows out. That's what happened. They saw the foundation and they began to sing because of all that it was going to be and all that it meant and all the joy. And it was just like, praise break, you know? They were out there swinging, singing, not swinging, singing. They were able to sing because they were reflecting on what? All that God is, all that God was, all that God will be, all that God has promised, all the forgiveness, all those things that you think about. How many of you ever just stop and think about how good God has been for you. If you really would sit down and really understand all that God has done for you, we'd find you running somewhere about Cleveland. You know what I'm saying? Because God has been so faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. It allows us to dig deep roots into God's word. Not only that, but it builds others up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves, not yourself, yourselves, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Praising the Lord in song or in a songful spirit is contagious. It's contagious. How do we know that? 
Because if you talk long enough and you praise long enough, you can start to hear other people use your, your phraseology. I'll never forget the first time I heard ladies say, well, if that's the worst thing that happens, I'm like, yeah, it's wearing off on people. Good, that's a, that's a positive attitude. Hey, if that's the worst thing that happens today, we're doing great. Could be a lot worse. Why? It's, it's overflowing. It builds others up. It gives you spiritual strength during trial. No greater example of this is found than in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas are in prison, right? They're in prison. And what do they start doing in prison? They start singing, don't they? Why? Because no matter what happens, no matter what befalls them, they have a Savior. They have their God. They know that they'll be with them no matter what. And so it gives you spiritual strength. Psalm, uh, Acts, Acts 16, Acts 16, 25 says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So it wasn't even just for them. Imagine you being in prison, hating life. And we're not talking about like Mansi or these, you know, you know, these fluff places you get Xbox and food and stuff. We're talking like an Old Testament prison, you know. <laughs> Nobody wants to be there. And dark, damp, dingy. And all of a sudden you hear dudes next door or in your same group singing about Jesus, giving praise, sounding happy. I'm like, these guys are off the rocker. How long have you guys been in here? <laughs> you know? But no, they were excited, they were happy, and it was strengthening themselves during trial. Not only that, but it allows you to walk the path that God designed. I want you to write these down because there's several of them. I want to show you a pattern that we see in, in the Psalms and in the New Testament, just to confirm that it's not just an Old Testament or Psalms thing to do. Psalm 9, verse 2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Psalm 51, verse 14, we know this is David uh, repenting and getting right with God. In Psalm 51, in verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Psalm 59, verse 16 says, but I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast seen my defense and refuge and the day of my trouble. James 5 and verse 13 says this, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. God has set out a path for our life that out of our rejoicing would come a song. And not just a song of you feeling good, because often, how many times do you say that? Man, I heard that song, it just made me feel good. No, the song that you're singing is to be unto the Lord. That's what it's for. And by you praising the Lord, yeah, you're going to feel good, but ultimately it's for him. That's what our singing and our praising, when somebody's up here singing a special, it's not so you can hear how good they sound. It's because they're trying to praise the Lord and they're inviting you to calm your heart and listen to the, to the song that is being offered to God and praise and you're not singing congregationally. That all has a point, okay? We don't just sing specials because we want to promote people. We do it for a couple reasons. One, it tapers the service down. You notice that? We always start with something very uplifting and exalting God and his majesty, and then we kind of taper into something maybe out of service or, or his faith or things like that, and then we taper into, taper into something uh, very um, uh, meditative or, or really getting you thought and getting your heart calmed down. And, and an even better thing would be to let uh, somebody come and sing a special so now you have the opportunity to sit down and listen and let God minister to you through song while you're not singing, then your pastor or whoever's preaching has a chance to pray and get ministered to before he comes to preach. And then they go down, and that's why we don't clamp when somebody sings a special because they're not doing it for performance. Uh, they sang that special, and we praise God for speaking to us and preparing our heart for the message. And then the pastor gets up there, Lord willing, or the preacher, and gets up there and lets her rip. That's the whole process of there, walking by God's design. Singing is not about talent. It's about testimony to God. So what do we see from this? Not only there is a order to it, but there's also an appointment to their song. It says that they were singing unto the Lord. Go back with me to Ezra. And it says there in verses 10 and 11, it says, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel and their trumpets and the Levites and the son of Asaph with cymbals and the praise, uh, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. So this was an appointment here. Now imagine, imagine the power of our worship if all of our songs were pointed to the Lord and not just for ourselves or for to sing. How many times 
and I don't want you to raise your hand because really it should be everybody. How many times have you come in and just done the norm? You open up your hymnal, you sing the songs because that's what we do. You sit down, you listen to preaching because that's what we do. You listen to the altar call, that's what we do. You pay your tithes because you do. Then you leave, you go home, you come back, and it's all a big robotic process. That's what we're missing out on. When you open up the hymn book, it's not about your, you're looking at the words, you're saying, Great is thy faithfulness. I saw a couple of you praising the Lord. Why? Morning by morning, your mercies are new. That's great truth for you to know about your God. I will sing of my Redeemer, whose wondrous love for me, on the cruel cost he suffered from sin to set me free. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. These are songs that are supposed to be sung unto the Lord. I'm just confessing, God, you did this for me. Your voice would increase 10 times better if you'd sing to the Lord. You know why? Because you wouldn't care what your voice sounds like. How do I know that? We'll look, in, we'll look here in a second, all right? So there was an appointment to their song. There was an application to their song. Why? It says, they sang because he is good and his mercies endureth forever. There was application to the song. It wasn't just to sing to sing, but it's because he was good and his mercies endured. So they acknowledge what he was. But also we see that they sang together and there was amplification in their song. It said that they sang so loud, it says shout, they shouted and it was a great shout. This is a unreserved, I don't care what anybody's saying, I don't care what he's doing, I'm praising my God and you can just like it or leave it. It doesn't matter because I'm not doing it for you. They were so excited. Let me tell you something. If, if uh, uh, you know, somebody pushed you out of the way of a semi and saved your life, you wouldn't be like, well, that was nice of you. Thank you so much for not allowing me to be road pizza. Appreciate that. No! You're going to be like, dude! I love you, man! You may, you may even give somebody a hug. You'd be awfully excited. No way you're going to be consent. You know how I know this? I've seen you guys watch football games and baseball games. I've seen you look at a new baby that comes in. Woo! When the Browns won against the Steelers, I heard Brandon yell from his house. Yeah! He's like, what? I know how it goes. I watch guys dress up like a dog on screen and sit there. You ain't afraid of yelling. You ain't afraid of looking like a fool. I'm not saying to look like a fool for Jesus, but I'm saying don't be, don't be worried about it. Praise the Lord and what he leads you to do, do it. I'm not talking about some crazy stuff. I'm talking about just worshiping the Lord and stop, get out of your mind, get out of your head and just let the Spirit of God lead you in that. There's a togetherness in their work and in their, and they sang together, but also they saw together. But this is the difference here. First of all, we see that they saw together they saw with sorrow they saw with sorrow it says here in verse uh, 11 i'm sorry 12 and 13 but many of the priests and the levites and the chiefs and the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice why is that they were the ones that had been experienced the most in the sense of exile of knowing what it was like before there's an old saying or uh, that was made famous, I believe, by a movie, but there's no place like home. And so exile is basically where they were out of their home, they were out of place, they were displaced. And the sorrow they originally were seeing was the fact that they're looking at this temple that, that was going to be built. Now listen, the temple wasn't even built yet. Just by the foundation they began to weep already because they knew this new temple was not going to be the, what, they, what it was before. But also I have to believe the part of it, too, was realizing the reason they're rebuilding is because of their own selfishness, their own decisions, that they were in exile, and now they're, be, they're having this opportunity to rebuild, but they wept because of what it took to get here. Now, again, like the Garden of Eden, you see that mankind had already rebelled, and what happened to them? They were exiled out of the Garden of Eden, weren't they? And we see that the, the children of Israel, they rebelled, and they were exiled out. And really, when they were exiled out, it really just shows us a pattern of exile in the world. The Bible says that we are just foreigners, we're strangers, we're aliens in this world, right? Uh, Jesus left his throne to come to this earth and this was not his home where he was supposed to be. 
But he came to give his life that we might be redeemed, that we might not be no longer exiled, that we might be reunited ultimately with him. What a pattern of, of how we as mankind rebel God. We do it our way. We do what we think. And God has done everything to reunite us or bring us back to himself. In their perspective, they saw this foundation building for what it was and what it won't be. But the interesting thing is if you look at the younger people, it says that they shouted in verse, uh, at the end of verse 12, and many shouted aloud for joy. And look at the combination. It says, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. So what was the difference? These people saw with sorrow, but this younger generation, these are the ones that were born in this exile, and they had come out. So they had never known what it meant to, to worship God in this way or be in this temple. They saw with joy. So what they saw, what was, and they also saw what could be. They saw what could be. And togetherness to me is bringing basically those two perspectives together. We have a generation of people that have served the Lord and they have seen great results of seeing people get saved and living for Christ. And then we have a new group of people that they want to reach people, but they have to be brought along. The older group looks at the younger group and says, they don't understand, they've changed, that's not the way I would do it. The younger group says they're old and rickety and there's no way that doesn't work anymore. Both of them are not true. Both of them are not true. 2021 is a whole lot different than it was in 1980. Would you say so? The only thing that hasn't changed from 1980 to 2021 is the gospel. We have internet now, 1980, they didn't have that, at least not the way I knew it anyway. Cell phones that you can carry in your phone, it's not a backpack. Computers, transportation has improved, but the gospel and the command to go out has not changed. But what happens is this great zeal that the younger group has to go out and do things for God is not getting, uh, should not get squashed by a look of sorrow saying, oh, it'll never be that way and I just can't wait till Jesus comes back because, ah, no. You need to help them off the shelf so they don't just do something stupid proclaiming it for the name of Jesus. Say, hey, listen, I love your ambition. I love where we need to go, and I need to have some of that ambition. But hey, let me help you out a little bit and say, hey, let's, let's be wise about this. That's why I love we have this Stand Together Summit that we go out to in California, and I love it because you have what they're trying to do is bridge the gap between the older generation and the new generation and get them together. Say, hey, listen, we've been doing it for 30, 30 40 years, some 50 years. We have some experience. Young guys, you need to take some of that experience that we have. Hey, older guys, maybe it's time to get a website. Maybe it's time to get, a, you know, tap into some of these things. I know some guys that think you're wicked because you have a, you have a TV scre or screen on your, on, your, on your church. I don't believe that. I believe God gives you means to, to reach people and do things like that. The internet could be bad if you use it for bad things. But they saw, one saw with sorrow, one saw with joy. But I believe those things together is what made their voice shout and was heard afar off. It says that it was so loud they couldn't discern the noise between the joy and the weeping. What I'm trying to say is if we can work together and we can sing together or praise together, then we should be able to see together. I may not see it how you see it, and you may not see it how I see it, but together, we need to see it the way God sees it and move forward. You can help me be uh, a little calmer, and I can help you smile a little bit, enjoy life. And that's what, we, that's what we're here for, right? To do it together. If they were to build this, try to build this uh, temple by themselves, the work wouldn't have got done. If everybody would have had their, how many of you have ever been in a project where everybody has a bunch of different ideals? Nothing gets done, does it? Nothing. That's why the emphasis here was they were as one man. It was as if one person was working, but there were so many different people working. 
They did it together. They worked together. They sang together. And what happened is their voices were loud together and it was heard afar off. I'm telling you, if we can get together. But the first step, the first step is you gotta be together with the Lord. You gotta know that you're saved. You gotta know that, that you are dead and you're trespassing in sin. Have you trusted Christ as your personal savior? And if you have, then there should be a difference in your life. A difference in the way you look at sin. Listen, sin is sin. If you can do the things you did in your old life still today, I would check my salvation. You don't give a rip about anybody else and worrying about their Christian life and the things you're doing hindering them. I would really consider my salvation because when I got saved, I actually have now a compassion for other people. Before, guess who I had compassion for? Me. It's the only person I cared about. God has changed that. And now it's about being together. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life that I now live in the faith. Uh, flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm in Christ. He is in me. I'm in him. Together. And so if you've got the Spirit of God in you, then we need to work together. We need to sing together. And let that thing, so we can see it together. Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy that does endure forever. Spirit of God, open the eyes of our heart that we might see your wonderful works, that we might see our sinful self. And Lord, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, talks about that if we would judge ourselves, if we would take the time to examine ourselves and judge ourselves, we wouldn't find ourselves in the position of having to be judged by other people. Lord, don't allow me to be so foolish to think that I'm going to live an entirely sanctified life because I'm still in a sinful flesh. But Father, help us to submit ourselves to Thee that You might mold us and shape us. May we be a vessel of honor to You, Lord. I pray, God, that every single person in this room under the sound of my voice would ask the Spirit of God to give them wisdom and clarity as they serve you. May no decision in their life ever be made without the Spirit of God moving. I pray this morning for that one that's here this morning that's not saved, that they would give their life to Christ. Stop questioning. Stop arguing with the Lord. Stop trying to convince yourself you're saved and give it to the Lord. Get saved today. Know that heaven is your home. Today is the day of salvation and let him speak to you. Let him change your life that you might be a new creature in Christ and old things will be passed away, dead, gone. And you'll be a new creature in Christ. Would you help those this morning, God, those that are saved and born again to work together, sing together, and see together. May it all be done as unto the Lord. Would you stand to your feet with your head bowed and your eyes closed? This morning, first and foremost and most important, are you together with the Lord? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that heaven is your home? If not, please, we have people at the front that would love to show you from the Bible how you can come to the Lord and be saved this morning. Christian, are we together knowing what God wants us to do and to serve him? Are we seeing foundations being built in people's life? Are we building each other up? Are we doing the work of the ministry? As Mary plays in the background this morning, the altar's open this morning, would you do business with the Lord? Would you come to the Lord? Let him examine your heart. Let him examine your life. Be honest before God. There is a lot of work that needs to be done before we leave this world. And we can't get it done alone. My Bible says, except the Lord build the house, the labor is vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watcheth, but in vain. We must do God's work, God's way. 
We must do it together. That we stand together for the work. That we stand together for the watch. May we sing together. If we're saved and born again, we have the same spirit dwelling in us. That means we have the same song to sing in the sense, I have been redeemed. It's a song that the holy angels cannot sing. People are so enamored with angels, but we have more to sing about than they do, being in the presence of God now. Do you know what your friends and families are going through here in this church? Because the Spirit of God does. Do you know some of the trials and struggles that people are going through here at the church? The Spirit of God does. Do you, so, do you know some of the prayer requests and things people are seeking God for here? The Spirit of God does. Maybe it's time we start asking God to open our hearts so we can pray for our brethren more intelligently. We can love them greater. And may we never be afraid to call sin, sin. Speaking the truth in love. I'm not talking about watering the gospel down. If somebody's going to repent of their sin, then they already know where they're at. And you should not be afraid to help them along. But let us determine to do it together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the Spirit of God giving us liberty this morning. I pray that you would continue to speak to us and move in our lives. I pray that we keep a short account with you, Lord. May we, just like these people in, in Ezra, hold you in high esteem that we might worship you the way that you have called us to, to love you unrestricted, to serve you unrestricted, to have genuine, authentic worship of you, God. And I pray that even over just the foundation being built, we would rejoice that much. We love you, Lord. Thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, don't forget, as you leave, to uh, be faithful in your tithe and offering. All those things keep the church running, moving forward, and all your faith promise giving uh, that we have. And uh, they'll have those sheets back in the back for everybody. Uh, please take one if you plan on coming to the business meeting and you are a voting member. That's your 18 years older. You're a member in good standing with the church. Uh, and make sure you take one of those. That'll give you explanation. If you have any questions about those or something you feel I missed, please let me know. And that way I can get that on their ASAP and get it sent to you because we have to have everything out two weeks before the business meeting. All right. Uh, glad to have you here. Brother Chris, I'm going to have you come and close this in a word of prayer. And... Uh, Look forward to seeing you back. Please come back tonight and uh, hear uh, Noah uh, as he's going to be preaching a message God gave him when he was at West Coast. And uh, just uh, he's taken serious the thought of be ready at all times to preach. And uh, he says, uh, God gave me this message back at West Coast. I think he wants me to preach it. And so he's been working it for a while. And I see every time I come in, he's back there at the computer studying and doing research. And so I'm just thankful for that and uh, the passion for the Word of God. They have helped me tremendously. These young guys and young ladies that just love the Lord and uh, not just our college students, just seeing, talking to you guys and uh, some of our older fellows that just ask Bible questions or listen to your conversations is such an encouragement because it makes me want to study more. It makes me want to know more and uh, to get truth. I'm just glad for that. So look forward to seeing you back here tonight, 6 p.m. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's pray. Lord, I'd just like to thank you for this morning. And Lord, I'd like to thank you for the message you've given, Pastor. Lord, I just ask and pray that everybody would go home safely today, Lord, and uh, return at our appointed time, Lord. We just love you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.